again, thanks to all of you for being here. And uh, I'm Ankur Jain. I'm a founder of uh, a seed stage venture capital firm called Emergent Ventures. Um, uh, you know, we have a fascinating uh, discussion today. Um, so Mohit have, uh, and I have many common touch points. So he was a senior from IIT Delhi. I was uh, at Bloomberg Capital, and which led the seed investment in Nutanix. And over the years, um, as I've interacted with Mohit, I think one thing is you cannot miss his brilliance. <laughs> uh, in a few minutes when you talk to him, it's, it's, you, know, you can certainly see that he's looking at the world in a very different way. And he's uh, founded two very fascinating startups, uh, Nutanix, uh, which went IPO last year, and then Cohesity, uh, which again, I'll, we'll talk more about Cohesity uh, in our discussion. So Mohit, maybe I'll maybe give a little sort of your own story so people have some context. But maybe I'll start it off with, tell us a little bit about growing up. You know, what, tell us a little bit about your background, where did you grow up, and how did you ultimately decide to be an entrepreneur? I grew up in, uh, in India, for the most part. Um, <clears throat> my schooling was done in a state called Punjab. Uh, and then everyone knows I did Delhi, where I did my bachelor's. And I came to the US uh, in 1995, spent uh, five years doing my PhD. And uh, I can honestly say that all during that time, I had no clue that one day I would become an entrepreneur. Um, I think at this, the germination of the idea started coming, I guess, sometime during my PhD. So look, PhDs are all about research. You're uh, doing something that no one has done before. But in academics, uh, you, um, it's a very pure field. You do research, you invent new ideas, and then you move on. You maybe publish a paper, and then you move on to the next idea. And while that is fun in itself, uh, what appealed to me more was to take what we had invented and bring it to the world. So I always felt that uh, that was the part that was missing. And uh, you look out in the world, um, you know, people were you know, taking ideas and bringing them to the world, but I always felt that those ideas were often not deep enough. We were doing far more exciting work in academics, and yet these ideas were kind of never brought to the world. We would maybe do some experiments and then move on. So that was really when I started getting the thought that maybe what my future is, is to essentially do research but make it way more applied, you know, that whatever research I do, bring it to the world in the form of a company. Uh, and part of the growing up was then to learn how to do a company. So you graduate out of uh, grad school, it's not like you start doing companies right away. For the, some of the younger people in this audience, I would <laughs> say don't be in a rush to do companies. I think it's very important to learn the ropes of doing the company in the right fashion. So I spent, I, uh, you know, I graduated uh, with my PhD in 2000 and um, spent uh, nearly nine years in industry before I did my first company in Nutanix. So that gave me a pretty good grounding on uh, what it takes to do companies. And now I, in essence, take, uh, you know, kind of generate knowledge and uh, bring it to the world and take it all the way as opposed to kind of publishing a paper and then moving on. So that was, I guess, my growing up in the entrepreneurial way. Very interesting. And so in 2009, when you started Nutanix, along with uh, two co-founders, how, how did that happen? When did you decide, okay, this is the right time to do this company? What was some of the thought process? Um, and, and what were some of the early days like? Yeah. Yeah. So let's go a little bit before 2009. Um, I left, uh, I was in Google from 2003 to 2007. And again, my ulterior motive was always to learn the ropes of um, you know, how to be an entrepreneur. But Google taught me uh, you know, a lot of stuff. It taught me how to build web scale technologies. It ta taught me how to deal with uh, distributed systems, how to think about them. What it did not teach me is uh, how to build a company. Because uh, Google was a very large company. By and large, Google is its own customer. Uh, you never get to interact with marketing, sales, or anything like that. So I made the choice of uh, leaving Google in 2007. And I joined a small company as the data systems. Uh, it was an interesting company. It was in the data warehousing space, so that presented its own challenge. There was definitely learning, um, e learnings to be had there. But the, you know, one of the biggest learnings that I was looking for was learning the ropes of uh, doing a company. And I think you, can, you know that you're ready to do a company when um, the company that you work on, people are kind of levitating towards you. 
people are looking at you for giving them information, whatever field you're in. So I was their uh, main architect. Uh, and the whole of engineering was looking towards me. Um, you know, the sales was looking mm -hmm. towards me. They would bring their customers. I would be in front of the customers. So I was kind of you know, almost uh, mm -hmm. running a large part of the company. And that told me that I think uh, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, that I can now you know, do a company myself. And there comes a point uh, you know, when you look at some other people doing a company, and like, if that guy can do it, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, that's just a joke. But, but th th that definitely happens in the world, that you mm -hmm. see some uh, very mediocre ideas and very mediocre uh, people mm -hmm. pushing those ideas. And mm -hmm. uh, I think you feel, that, feel confident that you can do it. So that's the kind of learning that you need to have before you jump out. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I talked about nine years of learning. I mean, in those nine years, I learned things on what not to do much more importantly than things on what to do. Mm -hmm. Google taught me a lot of things on what to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of the other companies I was in, uh, my very first company that I joined, uh, that's the only company that I was in that actually died. It was a company called Zambil. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned a bunch of things on what not to do. Um, mm -hmm. Although Zambil didn't have a great exit, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people that uh, you know, came out of Zambil mm -hmm. then independently did companies. Give us an example of something not to do from your Zambil days. <laughs> um, a lot of things. One of, one of them was, um, you know, your senior technical team uh -huh. needs to be fighting with the troops, uh -huh. not sitting in offices. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever a problem happens, then you leave the little guys to fight. Um, so that's absolutely a no-no because uh, you then create a class system. I'll, I'll give you another example. Uh, I know a company where, um, the founders uh, used to give out laptops. Well, everyone got laptops. But the laptop bags that the founders and the, and the execs had, uh, they were leather made. And <laughs> everyone else had cloth made uh, laptop bags. And that's absolutely a no-no. Because immediately, you create a class system. Immediately, your troops start stop identifying with you. You're like up there, and they're down there. And they then uh, you know, kind of won't share with you stuff. Uh, similarly, I, another thing I learned was never, never um, enjoy any privilege that's um, above and beyond your troops. So for instance, in that particular company, the founders used to sit in an office, and all the troops used to sit outside. Mm -hmm. So guess what? The troops had a big camaraderie between themselves, but they didn't identify with the founders. Mm -hmm. So I've made it a point in my companies to never take an office. I sit where everyone sits. Uh, I use what everyone does. I fly what everyone flies. I fly coach. I don't fly business mm -hmm. or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that I've learned. Uh, it's very important to create a culture where people identify with you. Mm -hmm. Because uh, remember, uh, this is Silicon Valley. You have yeah. 2,000 other companies that people can go to. The moment they're unhappy, they can go anywhere. And there are definitely people throwing money at them to hire them, the best of them. So they're there for loyalty uh, for a lot of times. And that comes when uh, they identify with you. Mm -hmm. right? They're with you in the ups and downs. Um, so those are some of the learnings. Very interesting. And so when you um, started Nutanix, so how did that founding team come together and what were some of the um, early challenges you guys had to overcome those days? So the founding team was all, so we were all working together as, as the data systems. Mm -hmm. um, I was the main architect, so I was the technical guy. Uh, one of my co-founders, Dheeraj, uh, he was uh, the VP of engineering, so he was kind of the, um, the mm -hmm. manager. You know, so naturally he, he became the CEO of Nutanix. I took on the CTO title. Mm -hmm. And the third guy was a product manager. He was a head of uh, product management. So he took the CPO title, mm -hmm. Chief Product Officer. So, uh, so those, th those th title assignments were kind of natural. But the early challenges that we faced, you know, all said and done, while we knew how to manage teams and uh, we had that confidence, we didn't know how to raise money. Mm -hmm. We didn't know the VC industry at all. Mm -hmm. We didn't quite have a reputation. The only reputation um, among us was a little bit me. I had worked on the Google file system, so that was pretty much the only reputation we had. So it's not like a bunch of VCs knew us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't know how to go about hiring uh, uh, you know, non-technical people. I mean, mm -hmm. We had done lots of technology, so I kind of knew how to interview and hire technical people. Mm -hmm. We didn't know how to hire uh, business people and marketing people and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. So those are all the challenges we had to work through. Uh, but we worked through them and learned uh, one step at a time. And I think Nutanix eventually was a great exit. But I have to tell you that uh, when I started Cohesity, you'd imagine that I would uh, know a lot of those things, having done them before. But I still now sometimes beat my head on the kind of mistakes I make uh, on my blind spots uh -huh. that I didn't learn at Nutanix. Uh, you know, part of the business hiring was my blind spot because my co-founders did uh -huh. a bunch of that, the VCs helped. 
uh, in Khijri it was different, but we leave that to, for another question. Interesting. So on the on the Nutanix, so like let's take a couple of areas. Let's say uh, fundraising as an example. So what was the learning curve there? What was some of the um, unexpected <coughs> events that you ran into? What were some of the insights that came out around let's say fundraising uh, in your experience? Yeah. So um, insights. So insights that came out were, um, you know, one of the things that, first of all, we had advisors, we, you know, uh, leveraged people, and they gave us some very good insights. One of the best insights that I want to pass on is the fact that uh, I don't think people should do companies that are completely foreign to their expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a great insight, because we were definitely tempted to do companies. Uh, for example, when we were brainstorming about what to do, one of the ideas that came up was to do something in high-speed trading. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was totally a no-no, uh, because we, none of us had any clue on how trading was being mm -hmm. done. And I think then someone gave uh, an insight, and I want to pass that insight to you. So this person, I will not mention the name of the company, mm -hmm. but this person did a company, which basically, the idea was that, you know, we all watch uh, sports. So let's say there's a tennis match. The idea behind that company was um, that they'll take the court in the tennis, uh, you, you know, the, the court that you have, and they'll morph the outsides of the court to show ads. Mm -hmm. So if there's grass on the outside, so it's not going to come in inside the court, but outside mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's going to morph into ads. It was a very cute idea. <laughs> Completely fail. Why did it fail? Because uh, these guys had no uh, clue about media companies. So when they actually built the product and they went to sell it, uh, they found that the media companies had such a big stronghold on um, the TV market and stuff that it's impossible to sell. Mm -hmm. So that told us something that said that, uh, you know, already in a startup there are enough unknowns. Uh, you start doing something which is completely unrelated to your area of expertise, um, you know, eventually a startup only has room for n number of mistakes. Mm -hmm. You make too many mistakes, it's going to fail. So, so that told us that we need to do something that is somewhat at least connected Mm -hmm. to our areas of expertise. So um, Nutanix, uh, for those of you who don't know, it was a cross between virtualization and storage. It invented something called hyperconvergence, not important here, but a cross between virtualization and storage. We were all new to virtualization. Uh, we had only used virtualization. We didn't know the internals. But we were very familiar, at least I was very familiar with storage. So at least I brought that part of the expertise mm -hmm. uh, into the company. Uh, and so that was an insight, but uh, you know, I want, also want to mention the challenge. Um, Two years into the company, when we GA'd the product, uh, we didn't even know a very basic thing in virtualization, because we were not virtualization people. Mm -hmm. And after the product began shipping, and we even made some revenue, we realized there was this one missing feature in virtualization that was very, uh, anyone who had any knowledge of virtualization would have known. Mm -hmm. But since we were not from the field, we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And that almost killed the company. And we had to literally work very hard to uh, almost pivot the product or mm -hmm. re-architect it to incorporate that feature. So again, to go back to, I think, do a company that is closer to your area of expertise so that you know the area, you know, chances of uh, uh, mistakes are less, it's a, it's a very strong insight that we got. Makes sense. No, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, one interesting um, side story to this is, you know, I used to be part of Lumberg Capital, which uh, invested in, in seed stage in Nutanix. And the idea of hyperconvergence, which was the Nutanix uh, uh, idea and what they were doing, uh, in hindsight, of course, it's you know there's a growing market and uh, Nutanix is successful. A few other companies in the space, but in those days, uh, people certainly looked at it as a bold idea. But by no means was it a um, you know was it accepted this will work. Um, even at when Bloomberg was doing diligence, there was they went out to a bunch of let's say CIOs and. It was a pretty varied feedback. Many people didn't really believe it's going to work. <laughs> so, what was your in those days? As you meet, you know, there are people I'm sure who believe in what you're doing. There yeah. are skeptics, and how did you navigate that ecosystem and feedback? So, I have a set of rules that mm -hmm. I use to evaluate the ideas on, yeah. I mean, and as long as it passes those, uh, and it, there are always going to be naysayers. Mm -hmm. But if you talk to ten people, yeah. and um, you get a validation for your gut. Um, that's what you use to go forward. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you what I used. Um, mm -hmm. You know, basically, I'm a, one of my filters is that your company needs to be aligned with the trends, mm -hmm. industrial trends. And the trends were 
uh, in, so Nutanix started in 2009. From 2000 to 2009, the network speeds had not increased. Commodity networking in 2000 was a gigabit, and 2009 was also a gigabit. But compute speeds, the number of processors in a mm -hmm. machine, mm -hmm. the storage speeds, they had all increased, uh, you know, if not by an order of magnitude, by at least two orders of magnitude, mm -hmm. something like that. So now you look at the world, and they're uh, running systems by putting compute on one side, storage on the other side, and networking in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then you question, the stuff in the middle is not increasing in speed. The two sides are. What does your gut say? Shouldn't you collapse them? Mm -hmm. Right? And so that was Nutanix, very aligned with the trends. And that's what told us that this idea would be successful. And then, of course, there's more due diligence, but I'm just telling you one of the things sure. that made us feel that this would actually Got it actually work. Let me fast forward a little bit, um, and we'll come back to some of the later stage at Nutanix, but let me fast forward to your new company, Cohesity. Yeah. And how did that, again, what was the thought process there when you said, okay, this is the time I need to start Cohesity, and how were some of the early challenges here different than the early sort of challenges from uh, Nutanix? Absolutely. So Nutanix was uh, in what we call the primary storage space. That's production. People run their production stuff on, on, that st on that stuff. But there is a bigger part of the data center that is non-primary, non-production. And that consists of um, you know, stuff like backups. It consists of analytics. Bulk of mm -hmm. analytics is, is non-production. Mm -hmm. uh, it consists of test and development, um, file shares, cloud, archival, that, mm -hmm. that sort of basically unsexy stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem was that um, this stuff was all bought from different vendors. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, remember Nutanix, uh, one of the things it did was by collapsing the compute and storage, it also brought simplicity to the environment. Mm -hmm. Now you no longer have to go to three different vendors. You could go to one vendor and get all three. Mm -hmm. So in, in, uh, in secondary storage, which basically had not been innovated upon in the last 10 years, I saw the same opportunity of taking all those silos and putting that on one platform. So that's what led me to explore that. Mm -hmm. uh, even, the, even if you look within backups, it's actually the legacy backups are pretty expensive and very cumbersome to use. Mm -hmm. You have to buy backup software from one vendor, backup storage from another one, a piece of hardware called a media server on which to run the backup software. So three vendors right here. Mm -hmm. uh, and just consolidating them is a huge boon to our customers. Mm -hmm. But imagine consolidating way beyond backups, putting test and dev on this, putting analytics on this. So that was really the genesis of the idea. If you think about it, your, your smartphone is an example of hyperconvergence in the consumer space. Uh, what used to be earlier a Nokia phone and a GPS player and a music player and a flashlight and a camera, you consolidated all that into one platform, mm -hmm. your smartphone. And we had kind of, our goal was to bring the same kind of innovation to, to data centers. So that was the genesis of the idea. And your other question is what, what were the initial challenges? Mm -hmm. uh, the first challenge was to keep the VCs away, I guess. <laughs> uh, so because of the success of Nutanix, you know, literally I left Nutanix in Jan 2013, and I raised money for Cohesity in October 2013, in the same year. But in those 10 months, every week, every week, there would be a VC in my office trying to give me money for an idea that I didn't have. Uh, and, and, and I said, no, I'm not raising money until I actually have an idea and I know how to build that idea. So I was very clear about that. So that was one challenge. It was just too, too much. Uh, too much hype. Too much uh, love. Too much love, <laughs> and it's, it's, it works both ways. Uh, it's very distracting. Uh, so that was a challenge. Uh, the second challenge. I, I remember coming to your office during those days. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. You, you were at Bloomberg, then you were at Nexus. <laughs> so that was a challenge. Um, the other challenge was um, you know, building a, a great team. I mean, I, I did attract a bunch of good people, but I mean, Bay Area is always, it's hard to find talent. Beyond mm -hmm. a certain point, you have to start looking outside the sort of mm -hmm. people that you know. Uh, uh, that's hard. And I'm, I'm a product person. Uh, hiring people outside my area of expertise mm -hmm. is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always a challenge. Uh, even now, despite all my expertise and stuff, I find it very hard to hire people in the UI and UX domain because it's not kind of my network. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so those challenges are always there. Um, the rest is all, I think, uh, you know, designing the product and building it, it's just the same route. Um, but those were some of the challenges, some Interesting. of the main challenges. Hi hiring is always a big challenge. So let's talk more about hiring. Uh, hiring, um, and as you might have heard from many founders, the team is essentially everything in terms of the company. So 
how do you assess people? How do you, when you hire, what are you looking at? And yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Fantastic question, because this is exactly where I beat my head on how many times I've made a mistake. And I've <laughs> learned a few things finally over time. So uh, again, I was uh, a product person. And what do you do when you hire a product person? Uh, well, you ask him some puzzles on the board, right? Mm -hmm. And I've grown you know, good over time asking those, those <laughs> you know, kind of difficult questions. So as long as the person can answer those, I'm like, OK, that's the guy for me. And I'm, you know, we were pretty good at hiring the product people. The problem was I applied the same concept to, to non-product people. <laughs> So you have a sales guy, I mean, what questions are you going to ask him? You can ask him a puzzle, right? Uh, so it became like, you know, you ask him a few questions, and he's seen some of those, that stuff in his company, and he looks, uh, you know, polished and presents himself well, and, you know, you're like, okay, go and hire him. And that's absolutely the wrong thing to do, right? Absolutely the wrong thing to do. So, so over time, I refined my algorithm, and the, the part that I was missing was uh, how to do reference checks correctly. Mm -hmm. So for the product people, sometimes I would even skip the reference checks because I was so confident in, in the interview process. Mm -hmm. But for uh, the non-product people, and now I'm a big, uh, I'm a, almost maniacal about reference checks. Mm -hmm. But I even made a mistake there. So the early, so I made some mistakes without reference checks, right? So I hired some bad people, then I had to let them go. Then I hired some people, uh, and I did reference checks, but I did the wrong kind of reference checks. Uh, the wrong kind are the ones where uh, you go ask people who they give you as references, <laughs> or, or you go ask their, their bosses. Uh, you know, one thing I have to tell you, and it's true even for me, if someone has reported to me, unless I really hate that person for some reason, I'm never going to say something bad about him. I'm always going to highlight the person's positives, and I'm going to hide his, his or her negatives, always, right? Because it's kind of like my kid. So you go ask a person, uh, who uh, this candidate has reported to, you're going you're gonna to get the wrong answer. The right kind of people to ask are either his peers or people who reported to him. They have very incent little incentive to <laughs> not tell the truth. So that became my new algorithm for, for uh, doing reference checks, that always find peers or people that have reported to the person before you hire the person. Interesting. Uh, so, so those are some of the things that I learned in, in hiring. Interesting. I think that's a very uh, good tip. Uh, I think I'll, um, around, especially around the people that, who reported to you. That's right. It's uh, very interesting. And so of course, the next logical thing is hiring is part of it, but the key to um, the building the right team is the right culture, setting the right culture. So what are some of the ingredients? How do you set the right culture? And, Again, would love to hear your experience both with Nutanix and Coisy. What yes. are some of the contrast in the culture, and how did you go um, differently in setting those cultures? So I touched upon some of that earlier. Yeah. Uh, I work with the troops. Yes. Remember, um, soldiers will respect you mm -hmm. if you are there to take bullets mm -hmm. in the trenches. They will not respect you if you're shouting orders from afar, mm -hmm. and they are the ones taking bullets. Right. So that culture was there from day one. I was a very prolific coder, both in Nutanix as well as Quizity. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the respect comes from there. They know that I know as much about the product, more about the product than they do. Uh, so there's no excuse that Mohit is sitting in his office and he doesn't understand uh, what we are going through. So mm -hmm. that is one aspect <laughs> of the culture. The second aspect of the culture is, uh, you know, it's uh, I come from research, like I said earlier. I'm a big fan of uh, keeping the atmosphere very innovative. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you should not suppress people's ideas. Uh, in fact, one thing that Google has taught us is that that the best ideas actually come from the grassroots. Mm -hmm. so the more you suppress them, uh, you're limited by then your intellect. right? If you're just telling your troops, do what I say, uh, and you're not encouraging them to come up with ideas, very soon the whole company is going to be limited by your intellect, which mm -hmm. might be great to start with, but you're going to run out of ideas. And by the way, you get busy with other stuff. And so where are the ideas going to come from? Mm -hmm. So you have to create a culture earlier on where people are not scared to come up with ideas. You have to give them venues to express those ideas, to work on them. Even if you don't believe in them, you give them some time to gonna go work on those ideas. I mean, Google has this thing about 20% projects. I don't know if it still has them. Uh, I, I think they do. So even Gmail uh, was, was a 20% project, for example, mm -hmm. where even if the company doesn't believe in them, give them 20% of the time to work on whatever they want to. So, so, so just keeping on learning all the time mm -hmm. is one aspect of the culture. The other aspect of the culture is humility. Right? Uh, very often than not, when I see a person say that they've done a lot and they've 
know a lot and they've been there, done that, it basically means the person has shut himself or herself off mm -hmm. and he's not learning anymore. That's the person that knows the least. Because the truth is, the more you know, the more you also know how much you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that is a very humbling experience. So being humble is very, very important uh, to build a good culture. Mm -hmm. Because that's when you know, the organization would learn and innovate and, and, and do big stuff. Um, so we, uh, I'm a big fan of core values. Um, mm -hmm. That uh, brings a lot into the culture. A lot of companies have core values that, uh, like they have 15 core values that nobody remembers. Um, I like to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. My core values, I want every employee to know them because they're very simple. You can uh, remember them by the mnemonic radio. R stands for respect. You've got to respect everyone. Uh, a stands for attitude. Mm -hmm. I don't like whiners, positive attitude. You know, whiners pull everyone down. Uh, D is for delivery. Eventually, even I get measured on what I deliver for the mm -hmm. company. I is for integrity. Don't tolerate any backstabbing or politics. Um, and O is for obsession, customer obsession. Mm -hmm. So these five values, every single person in my company needs to remember. Anyone who I fire is a repeat violator of one or more of these values. A repeat violator. First offense is okay, but you keep on violating it, um, you're going to get fired. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what you just talked about, um, one of the aspects that the more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know. And I think that's, uh, at Emergent, one of our observations over the, uh, in our, through our investments, as well as through my experience as an investor, is the self-awareness is uh, probably among the most important qualities in an entrepreneur, which determines success and determines how. And this is a key aspect of that self-awareness, which is around. So, and at Emergent, we, for us, even more important than external journey of the entrepreneur is the inner journey of how are they navigating um, this um, themselves, how are they managing their mind, their body, the stress, uh, the relationships, and how do they continuously evolve themselves for new challenges. So I would love to explore a bit into that. What's, what are some of the tools you use to keep yourself energized, motivated, and or how, do you, um, how do you navigate that? So, uh, do you mean from personal time management or? Both, both, yeah, personal right. time management could be other techniques, yeah. So, look, there are tons of time management systems in the world, and I'm not, you know, going to say, you know, different time management systems work for different people. Mm -hmm. I, I know people who are a big fan of uh, getting things done and whatnot. I personally, for my own time management, I, I'm a big fan of Scrum. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, it just makes total sense for me. Mm -hmm. So, literally, I manage my own time using uh, and there are plenty of tools you can use to implement Scrum. I just use a spreadsheet, a simple mm -hmm. spreadsheet, where uh, what I do, I split up my tasks into sprints. Uh, you know, Scrum has this concept that uh, you, know, you divide up your time into two weeks at a time, mm -hmm. and in those two weeks, you have a bunch of tasks that you want to accomplish, and each of those tasks, they're not time-bound. You don't have time limits on them, but you do have points. Mm -hmm. These are, uh, you know, uh, Fibonacci, they're taken from a Fibonacci sequence. And then as you do them, you measure your velocity, the number of points you completed in that sprint. And your goal is to keep on increasing your velocity of sprint after sprint. Mm -hmm. So I personally use that system. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, those tasks also include if I have to spend time you know, on, on some kid's assignment or something like that, that would part, be part of that. Mm -hmm. So I manage my time using that. The other aspect is uh, I think um, just you know, you, you're an entrepreneur, there's going to be stress. Mm -hmm. And exercise is a very important aspect of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of managing that stress. So exercise is a big stress buster. So I have to, have to exercise a couple of times a week at least. Otherwise, I go crazy. <laughs> so, so those are the, some of the things that I do for my own personal management. So just to go a little deeper into that. So first, the Scrum, I think that's very fascinating. Actually, I don't, I haven't heard of somebody using it as a personal time management. <laughs> Give us a couple of examples of how, how you use that in your okay. daily life. Yeah. Fantastic. So, um, what I'll do is uh, I divide up the year into quarters, uh -huh. right? Every quarter I set up a bunch of goals. Uh -huh. So let's say I have to read five books this quarter, uh -huh. right? So, and th so those are the goals, and then I have to accomplish a particular project. Uh -huh. uh, one project is done individually by me, but some other projects I may have to monitor. Uh -huh. So I basically write down all the goals that I want to accomplish um, in that quarter. Now starts the spreads. So, so in the spreadsheet there is a task, uh, sorry, a tasks for each thing that I want to accomplish in those two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, I'll read uh, maybe a chapter from this book and a chapter from that book and so on and so forth. So they all become tasks. 
And depending on the complexity, if it's a thick chapter, maybe I associate you know five points with it. Mm -hmm. If it's a small chapter, it's maybe one point or three points, right? And now it's just a man matter of every two weeks I have to accomplish those tasks, right? Uh, and one thing I would say that I do, uh, you know, there are some things that I have to do every day. I don't want to make them tasks. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I have to spend some time with family every day, right? I have to exercise every day. I don't want to make them tasks. Mm -hmm. I have to exercise. I have to observe. Uh, a decent diet. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I'll put a calendar on the side on my table, mm -hmm. and uh, every day um, on uh, it's a calendar I bought off of Amazon, and it's a box for every date. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have the sequence F D S E E W. Mm -hmm. F stands for family. So if I, I manage to spend some time with family, I'll put an F in that box. If I observe a good diet, I'll put a D. Mm -hmm. If uh, I did something that day for self-development, I put an S. And if I exercise, I put E. And if I do something useful for work that I plan to do, I put a W. Mm -hmm. So every day I want to see F D S E W, F D C U, okay. right? And um, the goal is to get it every day. So this is stuff that doesn't go in tasks because otherwise I can't have a task mm -hmm. uh, that's repeated every day. So these are the. This is my system. This is what I use. I should implement the Scrum thing in my life. Well, we had a baby last quarter, so that was my scrum task. I don't know how many points does that mean. <laughs> um, Stay awake. Good night. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of exercise, what kind of exercise do you do? So, you know, I've, over time I've varied. I, uh, when I was in, uh, uh, doing my PhD, literally I used to just run. Huh? Uh, run. I used to just run. Okay. Uh, huh? But then I started doing uh, weights and stuff. Mm -hmm. These days, I have more levitated towards going away from weights, but um, doing more free, weight, free body weight exercises. Okay. So now there are plenty of apps that you get on your iPhone and stuff. Mm -hmm. I use an app called Freeletics. And uh, I can do, it's fantastic. I can do it at home. Uh, takes about an hour. And uh, you know, just, it doesn't require too many tools and equipment and stuff, just mm -hmm. a mat. And maybe if you can run around, that's, that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. And then you mentioned in terms of one of the uh, aspects of the daily um, goals are self-development. So what kind of things are you doing for self-development? Yeah. So you know there was a point in time earlier on in my life when I used to read fiction books and stuff. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I personally now find it a waste of time. What kind of fiction? Uh, well, there is fantasy stuff written by you know I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the Robert Jordan. Mm -hmm. That's one. You know books like. Um, Sherlock Holmes or Agatha uh -huh. Christie, and uh, you know that you know, it's fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've never read a Harry Potter, but <laughs> I would call that also part of that. Uh, could be a scrum uh, task. Uh, and so now, <laughs> now I read uh, self-development books are like the book that taught me scrum. Okay. That's a self-development task. Uh -huh. Or uh, you know, there's a book that I recommend to everyone called Psycho Cybernetics. Uh -huh. uh, it kind of tells you that if you repeat a positive message to you to yourself enough. Uh, there's a ingrained your subconscious is like a computer, mm -hmm. so you almost program that computer by reinforcing the message again and again. Mm -hmm. As, at the same time, if you kind of talk negatively to yourself, mm -hmm. that itself also gets reinforced. If you mm -hmm. keep calling yourself a loser, you will become a loser. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the, you know stuff like that. That's what I like to read, and okay. so that's self development for me. Okay, uh, so primarily reading is re reading is a big part of it, okay. but sometimes uh, doing stuff, doing some exercises on the computer, okay. or you know. Stuff that is just, you know, reading philosophy yeah. is self-development. Uh, reading about, you know, uh, you know, the guy who ran in, uh, ran Intel, Andy Grove, mm -hmm. his uh, his book, uh, that's self-development. Mm -hmm. So just reading stuff like that. Give us some examples. Of course, your last ten, eight, nine years as a journey as an entrepreneur in both Nutanix and Coricity. What were some of the, let's call it, personal development capabilities? Let's say you didn't have earlier, and through self development you were able to grow into them. And what are the areas which you're still working on? I would say the one. <laughs> I'll answer the last one first. Okay. The one area that I'm working on is getting a good night's sleep. <laughs> 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 that I have, I still have not been able to conquer. Mm -hmm. uh, my timings are still uh, erratic. But uh, discipline and time management is something that I didn't have earlier. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, you know, you start off entrepreneurship, you're limited to, you know, I was a product guy. It was very easy, I'm just doing one thing, right? But as you kind of start building a big company, you have to, from one thing it becomes two, from two it becomes four, from four it becomes eight. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, you start learning that you just, A, you get a lot of context switches. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing task A, I can't start task B right away. Mm -hmm. There is a time in the middle that I need uh, to kind of reorient myself. Mm -hmm. And that wastes a lot of time. 
-hmm. So to learn how to uh, manage that effectively, mm -hmm. to minimize these context switches, to uh, learn how to say no, mm -hmm. and more, most importantly, to learn how to delegate. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do everything. You know, eventually phenomenal companies are built on teams, mm -hmm. and you can't be a hero and say, I'll do everything, and because that was my mentality earlier. Mm -hmm. So it is always about how to actually make the team capable. In fact, if people here read the Scrum book, it's more about the team than about an individual. Mm -hmm. So how to make the team able to do what uh, an individual just cannot do, how to enable them, how to empower them, mm -hmm. uh, that's you know, learnings that I've acquired over the, time, over, over the years. And outside of, let's mm -hmm. say, your professional life, um, what are some of the, let's say, other things which are influencing your life, or what are your other touch points with uh, the world, let's say, also the professional life? Well, I, you know, professional life takes a lot of, you know, <laughs> even, even when I'm with friends, sometimes I'm thinking professional, but, uh, but definitely my family, my family, my, my wife, my kids, my dogs, I have three dogs, three dogs uh, yeah. but also my, uh, my parents, uh -huh. uh, my father passed away last year, but my mom, uh, so they form a very close, so I, I mean, I try to spend as much time as I can, mm -hmm. as I possibly can with that. And then there are friends, and I'm the kind where, uh, you know, I, I always, when I was growing up, I had lots of friends. Mm -hmm. And when I've become an entrepreneur, look, I have to tell you, you give up something in life. Mm -hmm. Everything doesn't come for free. Mm -hmm. What I have given up is that my friend circle is shrunk because I don't have time for them. So now I, now I have very good friends, but I have few friends. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that I cherish my time with. So my weekends, uh, not all weekends, but some weekends I would spend with those friends, whatever, movies, you know, we'd call, you know, dinners, birthdays, what, what have you. But that's how, that's how life is. And how old are your kids? 12 and 10, so, and, and, and 3 and 2 and 1, the canine, <laughs> the canine kids. <laughs> so, so for your, let's talk about your kids. So how do yeah. you, in terms of your role as a, let's say, father, yeah. Yeah. what are some of the, uh, your learnings there? What are some of the things which, how you evolve yourself in those, those roles? Yeah. I think the, one of the learnings is that the kids really look up to you. Uh, mm -hmm. They, when you grow up, when they grow up, sorry, uh, they are literally modeling themselves after you. You do something wrong, they learn the wrong things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of, again, the same things that I was telling you about how to do stuff by example in a company, the same applies to your kids. Uh, anytime I tell them to do something and I'm not doing that myself, mm -hmm. they will get the wrong message. Mm -hmm. um, they will cheat. But uh, if I'm doing it, then they aspire to be that. So that's one of the big learnings. Uh, you know, you present yourself as a model to them. Mm -hmm. They automatically, it's just amazing. My kids are not very naughty, I'm surprised. Uh, and they kind of, you know, aspire mm -hmm. to become what I've become, almost to the point where I feel like not so much. Mm -hmm. I think you should go have some fun. Uh, so, so those are some of the learnings, but uh, spending time with them, which I don't do enough. Mm -hmm. I think my wife does a great job there, uh, but I do what I can. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just, you know, life is, uh, life and family are way more precious uh -huh. than this professional life. Sometimes we get so engrossed yeah. in the professional life that mm -hmm. we forget that. And I do also forget it. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyone here who's doing companies, I would say, pay a lot of attention to your personal life because that's what shapes you. So what have been some of the more that's a difficult moments in your life, whether personal, professional, um, and, and how, did you, how did you get through those? Personally, you know, the loss of my dad was very hard. And uh, my way of getting through that was to engross myself a little bit in the work. So mm -hmm. work is a big healer. Time and work together are big healers. Mm -hmm. So that's how I coped with that. Uh, professionally, you know, professionally a company is a bunch of ups and downs. Mm -hmm. um, and now I've gotten used to it because uh, whenever there is a down, mm -hmm. I remember the previous downs and I knew there would also be an up. So that's what helps me get through that down. Mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise it can all sometimes be very crushing. Mm -hmm. uh, something bad happens in the company. The company, I mean, you spend more time with your company than you do with your wife and kids. <laughs> so in some sense, the, whether you realize it or not, the company is uh, more dear to you uh -huh. uh, at a subconscious level than even your kids, mm -hmm. literally. And uh, something goes wrong there, it kind of hurts. And, uh, but you know one day it will become better. And looking further out, and not just at Kohe City, but let's say your, if you look at your lifetime, is there a particular vision or something that you feel, you know what, before I die, this is something I would love to have that kind of an impact in this world. Any, any thoughts on 
Oh man, I, there's a bunch of those things, but I, you know, frankly, I don't know if I'll get, ever get to it. When I was growing up, I was, uh, you know, studying for the IITs and stuff. Uh -huh. I was very good at physics. Uh -huh. uh, I would love to go back to physics uh -huh. and, uh, you know, kind of start doing some research over there. Uh -huh. But I'm so out of touch with <laughs> physics now after so many years. Uh -huh. I, you know, it's it's going to be a while before I can uh, ramp that up. But there's a bunch of other things that I want to do that uh, I don't know if I'll get a chance to do. I want to learn sword fighting. Or sword fighting. I want to become bodybuilder. <laughs> but at this age, I doubt I can do, I, I can do that stuff. So there are lots of dreams. Okay. But I think uh, once I do wish to retire, I might pursue some okay. of these. I'm very fond of astronomy, by the, by the way. Um, that might be something that I might pursue. Um, and uh, philosophy, I'm a big fan of philosophy. Yeah. So some, I have zero time right now for philosophy, <laughs> but, uh, but, but one day. Yeah, very fascinating. I want to open up to uh, some of the audience. Uh, they have a great audience here. You made a comment saying that they look at some people, it were mediocre ideas and mediocre teams that were doing companies and you were thinking, why are these people doing companies? What were the uh, uh, signals that made you think, this is a mediocre idea? Or there's a video founder. Uh, what were those signals? Look, I've seen some very uh, people who I thought were mediocre. They would do phenomenal things. So I won't say anyone is mediocre. I would say the ideas sometimes do look small. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm sure all of us here have looked at ideas that are kind of small. What gi what tells me the idea is mediocre is uh, I, again I said I have a set of rules that I use to evaluate ideas. Mm -hmm. And those ideas just don't pass must, you know, these rules. Uh, in fact, they would drop. Uh, and it, one, one, I, one rule I have is uh, I wouldn't do a company in a market segment that does not have a total addressable market, a TAM, of less than $5 billion. And I can't tell you how many ideas, how many invest, uh, sorry, entrepreneurs come to me for advice. And they're literally doing uh, companies in ideas that are like barely $100, $200 million TAM. And that, to me, is a, a probably a project within a company, not a company in itself. So that would, I would, that's one example of what I would not do. Otherwise, and I, I would also say very humbly that I have regarded some ideas as very mediocre, and they have turned out very phenomenal. Uh, if someone were to come to me and tell me about the Twitter idea, I would, you know, like, what? So, so there's always that. Uh, so you don't know what you don't know, but um, some of these ideas that don't pass my filters, I just think of them as mediocre. Uh, I'm only 30 years old. I do plan on starting my own company uh, soon and eventually. Uh, what, what kind of words of advice can you impart on them for how we can maintain and upkeep the culture of accountability? So the f uh, thanks for the question. Uh, well, the first thing I would tell them is um, that don't rush into doing companies. Do it the right way. I, you know, again, I uh, can't count the number of people I've met in my life who did companies too fast, too soon, and they saw failures because they didn't know how to do it correctly, and they just got burnt, and they decided it's not for them, and they decided it's all about luck, and some people get lucky, and and that you know that person was just not lucky enough to be successful doing companies, where the reality just was that he just didn't know the art well. If, if that person had only studied it, um, you know, and learned the art, he would have been much more successful. So my first uh, advice to my kids is to not rush through things. Uh, there's a natural process of growing up. Some, there are always exceptions. There are always people who get lucky. That doesn't mean that you will also be lucky. I'd much rather have my kids do it the right way than the lucky way, uh, right? Uh, and doing, doing the right way, they, if they also get lucky, well, that's great. But don't count on luck. On accountability, look, uh, it's the, the way they're being raised. Um, I hold myself accountable for what I do. It's not like if I do something wrong, I blame, blame someone else. Uh, my, my core values are very important to me personally. And like I said, the kids, more than what you tell them, they observe. They learn more by observing as opposed to what they're being told. So they learn more by if you lead by example than uh, what they're going to lead when you tell them something. So just do the right thing. If you are accountable for uh, your actions, then they will also learn to be accountable for their actions. Um, the theme I picked up on is your analytic culture is, is driven from research to the way you run companies, to the way you run your life, measurement, day-to-day -day 
So let me address the last one first. Uh, remember I talked about what I do every day. Every day I want to carve out uh, time for family, but I cannot carve out time for friends. Uh, the time for friends would be maybe on weekends and stuff. So that's why I don't have that extra F. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, I'll think about it. But let me start with the first question. I think uh, the question was, uh, where, where does, uh, in all this measurement-based uh, management, where does gut instinct and that sort of stuff plays into uh, plays a role. Well, actually, l let me just say this, that you, you, you must have heard the phrase that it's all about 10% uh, innovation and then 90% per pers perspiration. So the companies that I do are actually all, they all start from gut. Uh, but then once you have that gut, how do you make it into a successful execution? So what I gave to you was part of that execution. But I don't want to um, kind of in any way say that the gut is less important. So it's all eventually about generating the idea, right? And then once you have that idea, how to go about executing it is all these systems can do for you. But they cannot replace uh, the generation of the idea and just the raw thinking that uh, it takes. So, so it, it's definitely there. Um, but but you, know, you asked me about my day-to-day, -day, so I'm just telling you about the day-to-day -day I do the measurements. And what was uh, the, the, so there was like second question. What was the second question? Engaging VCs these days, what, do you sense any, it's, I almost sense like the, the Bay Area has gone to micro improvements rather than these huge business changes. Look, I mean, that's where I said sometimes you look at these ideas and they look mediocre, but I have to admit, sometimes I've looked at ideas and they look mediocre, but they turn out phenomenal. So, I mean, look, if there are tons of companies in Bay Area, not all the tons of companies can be phenomenal, right? So there are going to be mediocre ideas. In fact, people say that 95% of the companies are mediocre. Ah, they, they do fail and maybe are micro ideas. Uh, we, look, VCs are VCs. They're all about, very frankly, fear and greed. Uh, you know, you bring a phenomenal idea to them. Uh, the idea is well um, measured. It's, uh, you've kind of seen all the pros and cons, uh, and it will appeal to them and the greed will kick in, so they want to, they want to invest. Uh, your company does well, but one day the company starts not doing so well, well, the fear will kick in. <laughs> so that's the way the VCs are. So, so I, I, I think it's just human psychology. I, I don't think, uh, I can say, I, I don't think that psychology will change. No, I and also, by definition, when you talk about relative assessments of its ideas, anything which is relative, by definition, majority will be in the bucket which people will call unimpressive because it's a relative scale. So in any society, any place, if you put something relative scale, it's always you know, one of those Gaussian or whatever it was you want to call, in which case, because your relative frame is shifting based on what people are doing. I don't think the mindset changes. Definitely what changes is the area that's hot. So like you said, you may be in a hot area in one year, the space might be hot, but uh, four years later, that space may not be hot anymore. And the way the VCs look at you is like, all right, this is a, a guy from an old space, so that definitely is, is uh, but, but the mindset of that VC is the same towards the next hot space. Um, that mindset remains the same. I think it's just human psychology. And go back to the point of measurement, uh, and measurement is great when you're trying to build a machine, and you know, organizations come like machines, you optimize on that, you know, growth numbers, you define a metric and go out. But uh, don't you think, you know, uh, success 
success of business and you know the fact that we are actually using measurements so much. Uh, bringing that to life, where when you go to speak, you are thinking how productive was I, did I do this right or wrong, uh, you know, rather than, uh, that's, that's taking measurement a bit too far. And is that something that you think about sometimes? Uh, I disagree. Uh, all I'm, I'm not trying to literally measure every hour that I spend. That would be wrong. If I'm counting every hour during the day that I spend and whether that was a productive hour or not, that would be terrible. Then I'm, I've become a robot. Which is why, you know, I think I'd encourage you to read the scrum. All it says is a task has a certain number of points. It does not say how, much, how many hours or weeks you take to do that task. And all I'm trying to do is in two weeks, I just do enough points. And it's not... Uh, I mean, no one is coming to shoot me if I don't do those points. But I just try to be productive and try to increase my points every uh, every sprint that I do. Is there a particular, particular kind of scrum or a particular book or something specific? Yeah. Yeah. There, there is a, uh, I forget the name of the author, but the name of the book is Scrum. Okay. Um, and I, Four percent. I, 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 I do remember, I think it's Sutherfield okay. is the name of the author, uh, if I, if I get, remember the, uh, the name correctly. So that's the book that I would advise you to read. And you can find, I mean, it's so popular that you can find uh, gists of how to in implement Scrum. But I would go and there's a the psychology behind the whole thing. I would actually recommend that you actually read the book. So you would be absolutely right if I literally jot down from 9 to 10 a.m. I'm doing this, from 10 to 11 I'm doing this, and that doesn't even stop after I come home. And then I'm a robot. I totally agree with that. But it's very flexible. It's like I have to do this, tasks, uh, doesn't matter when I do them. Um, I can take off, I can spend time with family. That's why I have this other thing, FDSEW, um, that really keeps track of that I'm not too engrossed in this professional stuff. I actually you know, do uh, stuff for self-development, for my family. I do get enough exercise, that sort of stuff. So it's more um, fuzzy than, you know, and yet it's healthy. Because if you don't track anything, then uh, you, know, you can spend years and not accomplish anything. So I'm just wondering if you could expand on what you think makes an idea good or like a game-winning idea then how you came up with like what was your process in evaluating these different ideas? I'll take the question asked by a prospective entrepreneur. Uh, somebody who's ideating right now. <laughs> so just for correction, I, I said that the VCs, uh, were, we were not evaluating ideas. Okay. They were willing to throw money at whatever I want to do in the future without any idea. But nevertheless, I was evaluating ideas outside, but uh, I have a set of about 10 filters I use. I'll run through some of them that I uh, can remember off the top of my head. One is, I gave one already, which is, uh, is the market at least a $5 billion market? That's one of them. If it's less than that, I'm not going to do it. Uh, the next one is, uh, is it a good neighborhood? Uh, which basically means that, uh, are there other companies in that space that are doing well? And those companies don't have to do exactly what you're doing. In fact, they probably are not going to do exactly what they're doing. Uh, one example is, uh, in 2013, some friends of mine, and you may remember this, were trying to do a, a company in the desktop space. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a bad neighborhood. Um, so it doesn't matter how good the idea was. If you have you know, 10 dead companies in that space, uh, you're going to be not, get, you're going to have a hard time getting funded. Because uh, you might go and say, hey, but by the way, my idea is the best. And they would say the previous 10 guys also said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And yet they're dead now, right? So bad neighborhood is another one. A third one is, are you aligned with the trends? Remember I talked about Nutronics. Uh, don't go against the industrial trends. Uh, one example I can give you, it's not a startup, but uh, you know, people know the company called Barracuda. Uh, right now, not doing so well. Uh, they used to make a bunch of their money on email archiving and stuff, while email is moving to the cloud. So they're against the trends. They're trying to make money on something that's shifting. Right? That's another one. Uh, yet another one is, uh, uh, how long would it take uh, for a competitor to copy your idea. You may have the best idea in the world. You're the first one to have that idea. But once you start being successful, every eye is on, is on you, right? And they'll copy. Does it take three months for a company with a lot of resources to copy you? You don't have a company after that. Or does it take two years? If it takes two years, well, now you have a company. Because by the time they take to copy you, you would have moved ahead. You would have you know, added more features, added more innovation, and so you're constantly ahead. That's another one. Uh, one more is, uh, how long will it take you to um, 
reach 100 million in sales. If you're an enterprise company, if you're a consumer company, then how long does it take you to maybe reach uh, 10 million in eyeballs, right? Uh, so, so if that time is you know, 15 years, you don't have a company. Uh, so I have a set of these 15, uh, about 10 actually, filters that I apply before I ascertain that it's a viable idea or not. And uh, I say that even one is a challenge. If you don't meet one filter, it's a challenge. If you don't meet two, I generally advise don't do company. The question about this uh, combination of experience from mechanics how do you know what the conviction that yes, we have this 30, 40 customers who are going to be buying and hence there are many more of them. And how is that now translated into the OSU that you're taking? I think some of us are going through the journey or you have achieved that or trying to figure out how to scale that up. So any kind of insight? So the question is, uh, when do you know you have a scalable yeah, business? How do you know, how do you double down? Yeah. It's uh, a good question, okay. So let's talk about the early phases of the company, okay? You start the company on a, on a gut, on a vision, right? That's all you have. Thank you. <laughs> so, and now um, you, in the, now you basically talk to some customers, you kind of verify, you run it through some filters, so you, okay, it's a viable thing. The first thing I would say is the vision better be grand, because if it's small, somebody's gonna copy you. Right, and you will no longer have a company. But since the vision is grand, you will not uh, be building the whole of that vision. You'll take a subset of the vision. I call it, people call it the minimal, minimum viable product. And you want to go out to the world with a minimum viable product. So the first couple of years is spent building that minimum viable product. You don't have any customers. It's all just conversations. Now you place your first product in the hands of customers. This is when you GA the company. That is what I call a unqualified MVP, unqualified minimum value product. Why is it unqualified? Because no customer has actually used it. Uh, people don't know. The way you put it in the hands of customers, hey, Mr. Customer, here is a product. Uh, and then you will say, oh, but by the way, it doesn't have this feature. Oh, I'm used to that feature. And so there is a, a period of time when you go through refining the, the product. Um, so again, the phase of the company, you start with the vision, you start building the minimum value product, you come to a phase where you have an unqualified MVP, and now starts a phase where you're refining the product. In the refining the product phase, you are selling, because that's the only way you get feedback. But you're not trying to sell too much, you're not trying to expand your sales force too much, okay? The goal is to reach a point uh, that I refer to as repeatably selling MVP. And I'll define what that means. A, re a repeatably selling MVP is one where an average sales guy can go sell to an average customer without involving the headquarters. It's very, very important. Without involving the? The headquarters, people mm -hmm. in the headquarters. Mm -hmm. Building a phenomenal company is all about repeatability. What one sales guy can do, can do, the next one should be able to do the same, the next one should be able to do the same without any additional pressure on the company. If there is a point of bottleneck, if they, are, if they are going to call the support guy every time, or if they're going to call my head of engineering every time, well, that's not going to scale. Because you can do that for five guys, the sixth guy, the head of engineering is going to say, I don't have more time. So to answer your question, while you're refining the MVP, it doesn't really matter how many millions you're making. You should make some, every business varies. Uh, but what's more important is that you're getting that feedback to come to the point where you come to that repeatably selling MVP. Once you reach the repeatably selling MVP, then it would be foolish to hold back. Now you can literally hire salespeople and grow the company. Of course, you, could, you should do it in a measured way uh, because you have to keep the hiring quality up. You have to make sure that you know, it works in all geographies, you, you know, a number of things to watch for. But that is the time when you put the foot on the gas. Before that point, you're just conserving your cash, um, spending enough to gain more customers, just to learn what they need, where the bottlenecks are. Um, but then you press the gas when you have a repeatedly selling MVP. So I would say, don't worry too much about revenues while you're refining the MVP. If you can, of course, make as much, as, as much revenue as you can, but don't kill the organization by selling too much. Don't make anyone the bottleneck. Your whole goal is that no, one, no single person or no single department in your company should be the bottleneck. 
That's the way you build a multi-billion dollar company. Great. That's great. On that note, we are going to end this part of the program and we'll start the networking. But today, what we learned is incredible. You may go to an all-day seminar and not learn what I just learned in the last two minutes. <laughs> this is about uh, making, making uh, marginal cost of sales very low. So that, that creates the repeatability and credibility. That itself, uh, whole, whole day seminar, you may not get that in your head. So this was one of the best I've ever attended any event. Uh, I saw Akur uh, Vinod Kosta. Well, I learned from that, but today I learned more. Because maybe someone like Vinod is too high level, we can't relate to what he's saying. <laughs> but but Moin is still into the trenches. So today I'm like overwhelmed. I'm at a loss for words that we learned so much in the last one hour. So let's give this uh, amazing panelist a huge <laughs>